Welcome to For the Record. I'm Janelle Hall. This morning, less than two weeks before the primary election, we are hearing from more candidates running for office in the Commonwealth. Whether a political newcomer or a career politician, these candidates need to prove to you why they deserve your vote. Closing in on the 2024 primary election, we are only about a week away from Pennsylvanians heading to the polls to cast their ballots in big races. That includes for Pennsylvania Attorney General and a hot topic for those running is election integrity. And we have to do everything in our power to make sure that everybody has the, the access to vote, that everybody can vote in a safe and secure place. We just have to make sure that the results are, are fair and accurate, period. We're going one-on-one -on -one with a Republican who's pledging to bring a tough-on-crime approach if elected, plus looking to flip a Pennsylvania state Senate seat from blue to red. This is a huge opportunity for the entire district, and this is a big reason why I decided to completely switch gears and throw my hat in the ring to run for this seat. A candidate for the 45th district with why she believes she could have a positive impact in Harrisburg and looking to spend another six years in our nation's capital to be a voice for Pennsylvanians. Tax the excess profits of big oil companies and return that by way of a rebate to consumers. Senator Bob Casey highlights some of the biggest issues front and center in Washington and across the Commonwealth. Over the last several weeks, For the Record has brought you interviews from the candidates hoping to become the next attorney general. Seven people are running in two primaries, five Democrats and two Republicans. And now we're hearing from Republican Dave Sunday. He is the district attorney for York County and is a U.S. Navy veteran. He told our Michelle Wright he's going to be tough on crime if elected. You're a Republican promising to crack down on crime. That's Tell right. Tell us what would you do differently than what's happening right now? Sure. Well, to start with, if our communities aren't safe, nothing else matters. I'm going into my 16th year as a prosecutor in York County. So through that, we've been able to decrease crime in York County by 41% since the 10-year high. And the way that we did that was through holding people accountable, but also embracing redemption. And so when we look at the Commonwealth as a whole, one of the absolute number one issues facing our community with regard to public safety is substance abuse, and in particular, fentanyl. When you look at the, all of the crime that occurs throughout our community, probably 70% is either directly or, related, directly or tangentially related to drug abuse. And so at the same time, when you look at the drivers of crime, we also have a mental health crisis in Pennsylvania. And so going back to my record and the work that I have done throughout my career to start with, we were able to lower overdose deaths by 26%. And that's in a county that's directly north of Baltimore, which used to be the heroin capital of the United States. And the way that we've done that is working collaboratively in the entire community by holding people accountable, but also by um, embracing redemption. And so when I say accountability, you've got to go after the drug dealers. You must hold them accountable. The drug traffickers have got to be held accountable. The organizations that are trafficking fentanyl into our communities must be held accountable. Uh, we have to collaborate with police and the communities in doing that. And at the same time, people have to get into treatment. And so we have to have a balanced approach where people at the same time have access to treatment. Let's turn to abortion now. Such okay. a big topic nationally and here mm -hmm. in Pennsylvania. Let me start out by asking you what your stance is on abortion. As an elected DA running for attorney general, I can tell you that I have taken an oath to uphold the law. And the law, as we know, and post Dobbs, the law, this is, it's the will of the people as exhibited through the ballot box is who's gonna make the decision on abortion in Pennsylvania. I can tell you that it is absolutely critical that we have empathy for women and mothers, that we listen to them during this entire, I'll say, process to determine you know, what the law should be in Pennsylvania. And I think that we have to do everything we can to support them and provide them all the resources they need um, to be able to make unbelievably difficult decisions um, in their lives. Pennsylvania's uh, Attorney General played mm -hmm. a pretty key role in the 2020 election. Mm -hmm. um, you're very well aware of I what am, all yeah. happened with that. Let me just ask you first, do you think the election results were valid? So as the elected DA in York County, I have had an opportunity to investigate um, allegations of fraud that came to me as the elected DA in York County. And I can tell you that based on what I saw personally in that capacity, um, I saw nothing in York to lead me to believe that there was any fraud to the level that would overturn an election. 
All right. Uh, there has been an, a movement in the Pennsylvania legislature mm -hmm. to crack down on various ways of voting. Ballot boxes, mail-in voting, um, even an audit mm -hmm. post-election. What are your thoughts on, on changing the law regarding mm -hmm. election voting? No, I appreciate that question. So to start with, I think we have to ac accept as a society, regardless of how we got here, that there are many, many citizens that for whatever reason have chosen to not believe that our that the election results were valid. Okay, so we have to accept that that is the case. And when we look at the concept of fraud and elections, we have to recognize that our elections are the most important part of our democracy, period. I mean, that's what fuels our democracy. It's the foundation of our democracy. And we have to do everything in our power to make sure that everybody has the, the access to vote, that everybody can vote in a safe and secure place. We just have to make sure that the results are, are fair and accurate, period, regardless of what your political party is, because that's the foundation of our democracy. And Does that include changing some current ways that we vote, including voter ID, ballot boxes, mail-in voting? Does that include changing any of that? Well, I think that if, that if that was the will of the people, that that should be changed, then that's something that I certainly um, would, would support, because remember, we take an, I take an oath to uphold the law. And it's important to remember that when we look at our, our different branches of government, and we have to get back to a place where that's respected. And so when I'm running for the attorney general, I'm saying to the, to the people of the Commonwealth that I'm gonna be the attorney general, that's gonna be my role. And so the people, when they make the decision, whatever that may be with regard to the laws for elections, for abortion, whatever that is, then that's something that the attorney general must follow because I take an oath to uphold the law. So to your point with regard to voting, I think that it's critical that as a society, we really take a deep dive into, into the procedure for voting, into access to ballots, um, into making sure that it's safe and secure for everyone, because at the end of the day, in, you know, there's a concept in criminal justice called uh, procedural justice is what it is. And, and what it says very simply is that if people understand how you get to a decision, and if you're transparent in how you get to a decision, and if you're transparent in the whole process, if at the end of the day they disagree with an outcome, they're far more likely to accept it because they trust the process to get there. And so I don't have a specific answer to what that would look like, but I do think that as a society, we've got to have, we have to have this discussion in, a, in an open and fair manner and really listen to the people and decide and make, and have our legislature make those decisions. You can watch our interviews with the other attorney general candidates on WTAE.com. We're back right after this. Welcome back. Now we're taking a look at a local race in the 45th district for Pennsylvania's state Senate. It covers parts of the Mon Valley, South Hills and eastern suburbs in Allegheny County. State Senator Jim Brewster is retiring after holding this position for 14 years. And one of the candidates on the ballot is Republican Jen Dintini from Plum. She told me she believes knowing what her neighbors want and need would help her in office. Talk a little bit about your background, your experience uh, growing up in the district that you hope to represent and what kind of pushed you into politics. I am from Plum Borough, born and raised. I went to the University of Pittsburgh and then chose to raise my family back in Plum Borough. I own two small businesses, AmGuard and 3G Security Solutions, and we provide contract security guard service. We employ hundreds of people in the region, some of which are union members and we're very proud of that. Um, I'm a mom, uh, I'm a wife, I'm a stepmom. Mm -hmm. We have a beautifully blended family of four children mm -hmm. and uh, we're very active. We're at sports and dance and, and all the things and I participate in the Baseball Softball Association mm -hmm. as well as uh, the PTO. There's a lot of focus um, on the pending sale with U.S. Steel, which obviously is right smack in the middle of yes. that district. Give me your thoughts about Three that. Three plants. You know, Three plants are in this district. Three and different, so, yeah. Yes, and so it's critical. 
I mean, everyone is very emotionally involved, and rightfully so. And I think that what the real issue is, is why are we here? How did we get here? How did U.S. Steel get to this point that it is for sale? And I think that we can point some reasons to the barriers that have been put up by local politicians and policies that are um, not working in favor of the steel industry. Uh, just recently, a few years ago, they were going, U.S. Steel was going to invest a billion dollars into the Edgar Thompson plant. And because of the cumbersome permit process that we have, they weren't able to start those upgrades. And so they, they decided to scrap the project. And that's a huge loss to our community. And they have put funds and investments into other states instead of here because where you have places that are business friendly, that's where the businesses go. So I think that we need to be cutting the red tape and the barriers for businesses in Pennsylvania and doing what we can to work with them so they come here. So how do you balance that between listening to the business community, <clears throat> business owners like yourself, people who want the jobs, and also tackling the issue when it comes to the steel mills? Uh, complaints and concerns about clean air. Right. So I think that, again, priorities are definitely keeping our steel mills open and our job creation. People that work at U.S. Steel are brilliant, and I think that instead of putting in these fines that we do, we could be using that money towards um, environmental responsibility. And so investing back into our environment instead of just putting excessive fines on them. One of the other issues is transportation. Mm -hmm. We talk a lot about <clears throat> different challenges different neighborhoods may have in terms of access. What are your thoughts on what may need to come to the Mon Valley or some things and the other communities? So the Mon Valley Expressway is starting its third phase now, which is great. And the fourth phase will eventually come out to the parkway in Monroeville. And that's gonna be a game changer for people that live here because that's part of the issue that we have is that it's not easy to get throughout this district. It's, it's just not. Um, the highway system isn't built yet. Um, so I think if we can do that, it just, it opens up so many doors and conveniences for the people that live here. One of the things I meant to ask you, right now this district is represented by a Democrat. Yes. As a Republican, what do you hope changes in the district and why do you think this is such an important race, you know, in terms of, you know, this seat and keeping your beliefs in, intact yes. in this district? So this is a huge opportunity for the entire district and this is a big reason why I decided to completely switch gears and throw my hat in the ring to run for this seat. Mm -hmm. We have had a Democratic male senator since 1961 and for the last 30 years the democrats have had the minority in the state senate so keeping in mind that the republicans have the majority and i would be the next elected republican senator that opens up huge opportunities for our district to pass legislation to get grant funding for important projects that we have that's something that this district, like I said, in the last 30 years, hasn't experienced. So this is all about creating opportunities for us. Um, <clears throat> I wanna ask you a couple specific uh, questions. When we talk about public safety, education, and mental health, I know that those have been key issues for you. If you could just um, kind of tap into each of those topics and talk about your perspective and some things that you may want to see where you may want to see change in those areas. I think our communities need to be united and support our police and on all of our first responders, you know, fire and EMS as well. Um, and then the next part about education, uh, the courts have already ruled that we are not properly funding our education system and we need to make sure that we're doing so. Um, and also being able to empower parents at the same time to have, you know, a say in their children's education. I think that it's a, it's a group effort that should all be working together. And then to touch on mental health, I think that particularly since COVID, um, some of the negative stigma related to mental health is starting to go away, but I think a little bit of it's still there. <clears throat> our minds are a part of our body, like we take care of everything else, mm -hmm. try to eat right, exercise, go to the doctor when something doesn't feel right. And I think that that's the acceptance that we need to have around mental health and increase resources for people, particularly our kids.
You can find our interviews with other District 45 candidates on the WTAE mobile app. We're back right after this. Welcome back. A big statewide race in 2024 is for U.S. Senate. While both primaries are uncontested, you'll see two familiar names on the ballot. Bob Casey is seeking his fourth term, and Dave McCormick is running again. He took on Memon Oz in the Republican primary in 2022. Oz went on to the general election, losing to John Fetterman. Our Sheldon Ingram spoke with Senator Casey about an issue impacting all Americans. Let's look at uh, one of the hot topics. It's always a hot topic for any election is inflation. Um, it's one of the highest rates of inflation that we've dealt with in recent years. Um, I guess we're close to 6% over the rate of inflation right now under the Biden administration. Um, do you see any relief in, in sight with that? And, and how can that be addressed by Congress, specifically by a person like you seeking re-election. Obviously, inflation went really high in, in the post-pandemic period. It's come down, but one of the problems right now is even though the, the overall number is down, people are still not only feeling, but, but actually paying a lot at the grocery store by way of one example. And that's why I've focused on this problem that I think people have seen for years but are just beginning to, to focus on now, which is greedflation that corporate profits went up in the, the period July of 20 to J July of 22, that two-year period, corporate profits went up 75%. So big companies, after getting a big tax break, then had huge corporate profits, and that was driving, in those first two years, about 40% of all the inflation in the country. So how so, does that work? Because there are, yeah. there are a number of complex factors right. that cause inflation to go up and to come down. And you're seeing that accounted for 40 percent in the first two years, and continued into 2023. So, but how does that work? Explain to us how, yeah. how that happens. Well, corporate profits, the Federal Reserve found, were, were driving a lot of the inflation. When the when their when their their profits are up, their profits are up five times the rate of inflation. And so, uh, economists have coined used the, the term greedflation for that. And what I believe we need to do is not only help the consumer deal with that. That's one part of it with, with a middle class tax cut or uh, a better child tax credit to help families pay for food. But we have to crack down on greedflation by passing a, a price gouging, a corporate price gouging bill to give the Federal Trade Commission the power to go after these companies, hold them accountable when they're jacking up uh, food prices. We shouldn't just settle for that. We shouldn't just say, oh my goodness, uh, food prices have been, have been high all these years and we're just going to let corporations get away with it. We have to crack down on this problem. The related problem, which you might, might have heard of, is shrinkflation, where they're ta over and over again, not just a, a bag of Doritos or a bag of, of cookies, but laundry detergent and so many other examples, where they're shrinking the product, but not shrinking the price. That's a ripoff, and it's, it's corporate greed, and we have to crack down on it. So th that's one major thrust of our work to try to help consumers. How do you reverse the trend of rising fuel costs that we've seen under the Biden administration. When you have uh, big oil companies making record profits, I believe that the way to attack that, one of the, the central ways to attack it, is to go after those, those excess profits, to tack, tax the excess profits of big oil companies and return that by way of a rebate to consumers. That's the only way big oil is going to get the message, to tax their excess profits and return it to consumers. That's one good, I think that's one way to approach the, the problem of higher gas prices. Where do you stand on the Israel, Israel and Palestine conflict, the Ukraine and Russia war? Yeah. Where do you stand on both of those? Well, the first thing we should do with regard to both uh, the, the, the effort to defeat Vladimir Putin, he has to be stopped, he's a murderous dictator. There's, there's no question we should pass the Ukraine security bill. But that bill also contains help for Israel to, to continue the war 
against Hamas. How does this bill affect sympathizers for Palestinians? We know it's, it's, it's going after Hamas, right. but there are I, Palestinians, and there's a difference between the two. Part of this bill also will be uh, billions of dollars through humanitarian assistance. Uh, just the, the, the assistance for Gaza, the humanitarian assistance for the people of Gaza, would be $1.4 billion in this bill. So it would be a bill that will help the objective of defeating Hamas, but also help uh, the people of Gaza. And we've got to do a lot more to get food aid, to get medical supplies uh, and, and medicine into Gaza. The United States has to do more. The Israelis have to do more. The Arab countries and the Gulf states all have to do more. We have to rush aid into to Gaza to help those, those families. Now, if there is a hostage deal and the shooting stops for, for a while, for hopefully a, n a number of weeks, that, that aid can get in uh, without a lot of obstruction. Barrett, and the last question, the Rail Safety Act, which you helped sponsor yep. last year, and we're referring to that train derailment in East Palestine yep. uh, last year. Um, a lot of deregulation unions and people involved in the rail industry say that deregulation was one of the reasons why there were lax efforts to protect the rail system, which yeah. in sense caused that, that derailment. Where does the Rail Safety Act stand at this point? There's good news and bad news. The good news is we have bipartisan support, meaning enough Republican senators to make it bipartisan. I think on our side it'll be every, every Democrat in the end will vote for it. But the, 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 the votes in the Senate to pass the bill have to hit, have, we have to get 60 votes. We're told by uh, the Republican senators that those who support it, uh, that they're, they're stuck at about, we're stuck at about 58, so getting all the Democrats plus a small number of Republicans. We need about two or three more Republicans to pass the bill. That's where it stands. For the record, we'll also be interviewing Republican Dave McCormick. You can see his interview coming up later this month. You're watching For the Record, and we'll be back right after this. Welcome back. If you have a topic you'd like us to address, send us an email to news at WTAE.com. You can also rewatch this episode or any episode with the Very Local app on your smartphone, tablet, or smart TV. Thank you for joining us. Have a good week.